initiative seminar. We're going to do a hybrid today, and this is exciting. So uh, just for, uh, we have six people in the room and a dozen online. If you have a question for <laughs> Melissa, please uh, either type it in chat or raise your hand. And, and I'll let you in and let you vocalize it to Melissa. Okay, so that, that's how we do things. And I'm happy to be interrupted if we can make this work. And without anything else? Okay. It. So you have to now you have to mute. Yeah. Okay. Hi, everyone. I so enjoy being the guinea pig. We're gonna, <laughs> um, and I so enjoy both actually having some faces here and knowing that there are people online. And um, I uh, look forward to giving you this talk. I will admit two things. This is the very first time I've given this talk. So if I'm a little clunky, please, please bear with me. And also this talk is at a perfect, perfect time to get feedback. So my lovely colleague and co-author Kat, uh, Katie Pine and I have written up this manuscript and we submitted it to MIS quarterly. We decided it wasn't actually like an orgs paper in many ways. And we got a very positive revise and resubmit, but we have to actually do the work. So this was a lovely opportunity to kind of crystallize what we think we're saying. And um, what we need to do is push forward the theorizing a little bit more. So I'm very, very open for feedback from you. And you will see why in some ways it's not an orgs paper. We're really talking to some sections of the IS community and thinking about the nature of data in organizations. So there is some organizational um, kind of ramifications here. So we're calling the paper, Feeding the Machine Out of Thin Air, Data Crafting in the Data-Driven Organization. And data crafting is a term that we're bringing in to try and articulate and shed light on the actual micro processes of managing data that happen on a daily basis and kind of try and get away from the idea that data is just there to be harvested. So you all don't know, I mean, you all don't need to be told this, the idea that there's a lot of kind of excitement and you know, kind of fervor around the idea that data can actually revolutionize organizations and that we have more and more technologies that allow organizations to both kind of capture different facets of organizational practice and therefore by capturing it, manipulate it and manage according to what the data tells us. So this is like a real, you know, a lot of these are from HBR, the idea that big data is gonna revolutionize all that we do. We don't disagree with that, we're just thinking that we need to untangle and unpack what that actually means on the ground. The empirical site for where we're looking is healthcare. And healthcare is really important and a really interesting spot for these questions for a couple of reasons. One, federal mandates, that if you are actually not quote unquote being data driven and operating to certain forms of federally mandated measures of quality, you're not gonna get money. So this is critical. They cannot avoid living in terms of these measures. And these measures are brought by the Joint Commission. So this is the Secretary of Health and Human Services from 2014 to 2016. She was behind the quality payment goals ideals, which is the idea that if you can see over here, since 2018, 70% of Medicare reimbursements are tied to quote unquote quality of care. And starting recently in 2019, clinicians themselves, so individual clinicians who take Medicare patients are subject to quote value-based reimbursement. That means you will be reimbursed more or less as an individual, depending on how much your metrics measure up to the Joint Commission's ideas of quality. And these are, this is like a sliding scale of payments based on individual performance. These are also important because these federal mandates with the kind of federal insurance reimbursements they're just the bellwether, right? So all of the private insurance companies are gonna follow this. This is not just gonna stick within the government. And so Centers for Medicare and Medicaid, oh, this is what I just said, they're the bellwether for all their insurances. And so this is the merit-based incentive payment system, which is looking at the maximum, you can, you can go from negative four to 9% differences in adjustments based on your individual performance metrics. This is big money for individuals. And then this is looking at components of the score, of the MIPS score, which is where you're being reimbursed by. And this is, you can see a full 50% is based on quality. So then of course, the million dollar question is, what is quality? 
right? And then this was a great story from the Washington Post in 2015 talking about, we're basing all of this on ideas of quality, but what quality is, how it's, and, and most importantly, how it's measured, and then how practice is actually existing in relation to these measurements. This is a big, messy, messy, messy problem. So this is not clear cut at all. And one of the things that we found in the field itself was this kind of emic understanding that you could turn the dial on health care quality. You could turn the dial by changing the measurements, by changing the benchmarks, by saying, oh, we're going to hold you to this benchmark, or we're going to measure this new thing, that this would actually have almost a direct cause and effect into the, the quality of care and the quality of practice. We come at this as critical theorists going, okay, well, what does quality mean? And what, what are you kind of changing the dial in service of? But that's some of our bigger questions. But this idea that this is, this we're putting, I put this slide up here to suggest that this is a really, really commonly shared idea among our participants themselves. Yeah. Are you even worried about the incentives to manipulate quality? Well, so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, so, so, so say your question again and I'll answer for yeah, rest. So there's, there's two types of of manipulations that I'm worried about. One is I actually don't accept patients that are really high risk. Um, and so I just, it's, yeah. you know, I, I cherry pick my, my patient pool because I yeah. can't. Um, the other one is I need to go right. patient risk yeah. so that I can emphasize the importance. So this, this question here, just for those of you online, was about whether or not clinicians or hospital systems are kind of manipulating the incentives either by not taking high risk patients or by kind of misdiagnosing or miscaring for patients because of questions of quality. I will say my answer to that is probably. <laughs> That's not what we saw because we were looking at the kind of system level and we were looking before some of the stuff got implemented. So this data were collected in 2014 to 2016 which was really before they were, they were in anticipation of these mandates coming down. So whether or not they're kind of how they're manipulating the game since then is not what I have empirical insight into, but kind of their anticipatory work to try and develop the, the kind of capacities and capabilities to be a data-driven organization. That's what we were looking at. Though I will say there was one very interesting that I'll get into empirical story of uh, the one of the hospitals trying to change their C-section rate, which is a very, very political and quality, quality measure and lower the elective C-section rate. And they attempted to go from a system level or a hospital level analysis of C-section rates to an individual clinician level. And it proved impossible. It actually proved like they couldn't do it because the way the system measures, they, if you're a resident and you decide to perform an elective C-section, you're actually, your clinician number is on the educator, the kind of the top, the attending and yeah. So you can't actually, pinpoint. So the idea when you change scale like that fully, you know, undermines the quality of the data. Okay. So what is a data-driven organization? You probably know this. It's a combination of the tools, abilities, and most importantly, a culture that acts on and with data. And the idea that data-driven decisions are better decisions and using data enables managers to decide the basis of evidence rather than intuition. And evidence-based medicine, as you know, is very, very important. And performance-based management is dominant form of management. Okay. We are coming up with the term data-driven decision, data decision-making ecology. And this is the idea that it's not just the tools, but it's also the tools ability and kind of the way in which they all come together. That we wanna look broader than just the tools and just the immediate capacities. And it's our term based on a information ecology, a word used by Baker and Bowker. So I'm gonna be talking about the data-driven decision-making ecology. Okay, so what's some of the, the literature that we're in conversation with here? Well, first of all, there's a lot of this popular literature that really suggests that this should be easy and doable for, for organizations. So the data is hiding in dusty corners. This is not a term I used, it's a term that's out there, ready to plug and play. So these are these kind of catchphrases out there, like, look, organizations, you already have these data, they're super powerful. They are, you're on the cusp of revolutionizing your, your capacities. You just need to plug it in, buy our system and plug it in. Now, I think you know, people here in the audience were laughing, like there's a bit of an eye roll to this. Anybody who's actually studied organizations knows it's a lot more complicated, but this is definitely the narrative out there. 
And then there's this kind of slightly more nuanced IS literature perspective, which really is looking at the properties of high quality data and do a lot of papers trying to tease apart what does good data look like. And they're really attentive to the idea of garbage in, garbage out, which is, you know, garbage in, garbage out. Obviously, you have garbage coming in, then the, the kind of outputs of your data are also going to be garbage. And there's more and more recognition of this in the popular management world and, you know, kind of this, this scope at large. But in both of these situations, I think this is important. Data are seen as having inherent pre existent characteristics. There is such a thing as good data. You might have to clean it. You might have to, you know, reformat it, but it exists. So good data exists and it has these pre existing semi stable characteristics that can be man managed and measured and lead to the promises. And this is something that we want to question here. Lastly, there's a critical data studies literature, which looks at really understands the idea that there's a famous book called raw data as an oxymoron. So this idea that there is no raw data, there is no data that exists in perfect state. Data are never complete and harvest harvestable entities that are kind of sitting ready for you to plug in and that they're cooked. So all of those manipulations to make them into good data actually have this kind of crafting or subjectivity is baked in about what good data looks like. So this is interesting. Now, this, this is kind of this theoretical literature, I think it's quite interesting, but there's really minimal attention paid to the actual situated practices, how this works on the ground. And that's what we're gonna get into here. One of the things that I wanna start at is what does good data even look like? Now, this is, it's interestingly, you know, this probably happens in a lot of kind of inductive research. We went into the field, we did, you'll see the whole method slides coming up. We did lots of qualitative analysis. And we kind of induced from our field work what the properties of quote unquote good data were, the data that had integrity. And then we went back to literature and realized that this has already been said. <laughs> and actually our properties aligned almost exactly with the properties in literature. So this is not the findings of the study, it's more of just a reaffirmation that what does good data look like? Well, it has the properties completeness, validity, consistency, and accuracy. And complete, completeness basically means that all the fields are filled out. So if you have a form, there's no null, you know, there's no null fields. That the, that the, that the data is complete vis-a-vis -vis the input platform or the input, you know, that it's going to be put into. Validity is the idea that there are standard measures. So that we, you know, that the idea that, that the data is valid if it is, oh wait, no, that was accuracy. Sorry. Validity is that it measures what it's supposed to measure. Right. So if you're measuring a phenomenon in the world, but that phenomenon is actually being captured in the data collecting practices and in the data collecting systems. Consistency is the idea that we have standard forms of collection. And actually, this is really tricky in practice. So in, in healthcare, we were looking at OBGYN context. What, how old a fetus is, is highly subjective. And there's about three different ways of measuring how old a fetus is in weeks. Could be, and different kind of clinicians and different coders will measure the fetus differently. Meaning like, is it date from your last period? Is it from the first ultrasound? There's these different ways of calculating the age of the fetus that are actually quite substantially different. And if you're using different ways of measuring, you cannot have consistency among how old a fetus is. And then accuracy is kind of across a whole, Type a bunch of different data gatherers, are they doing things in the same way? So consistency is, are we all, is one person measuring it the same way all the time and accuracy is across a population. And all of this, what we're trying to say is in relation to a particular data-driven decision-making ecology. And I'm gonna unpack that, yeah. So timeliness, so, so Becky's asking about timeliness of the data. I think that timeliness absolutely matters in terms of whether or not it's complete, and whether or not it's considered valid. Like if you're measuring something from five years ago and that's not accurate anymore, then it's no longer like validly measuring the population. But that's true. But what we're going to get at, which I think is going to actually answer your question more broadly, is when does data become bad really quickly? And this is one of our core insights. So our research questions for this study are, under what conditions do data with high integrity, data that actually display these properties vis-a-vis -a, -vis a particular ecology, almost practically overnight, is that data you know, degraded in its quality? So what are the conditions that can lead to changes in the integrity of data resources? And then how, given 
that we what we're going to show you is that that happens this happens all the time that good data becomes bad data almost instantaneously based on a change in the ecology then how do organizations actually maintain their data resources to have some take sufficient integrity over time and this is the process of data crafting so this is what organizations actually have to do given the fact that data don't have inherent properties in our argument okay so the case here was an initiative to apply data-driven decision making to maternity services we were operating both at the organizational level and at the kind of wider um, state policy level and this is what this, this is where we looked so we went into a small data system i mean sorry hospital system um, and we spent a lot of our time here in three hospitals observing and interviewing and when i say observing and interviewing we were observing and interviewing practice like actual you know clinicians but we were also observing and interviewing coders insurance coders birth certificate record keepers um, this was based on a, a NSF grant that was we called the microorganisms of big data. So where do the data actually come from that are fed into these systems? But then we actually went to a statewide data center, which this is this is one of their multiple people, they're one of their clients, which was taking data from all of their hospital clients, creating algorithms, manipulating it, and making it into measures that they spit back into the hospitals. Um, we also they were highly connected with the statewide quality improvement organization. And then we went to also some kind of accompanying conferences and kind of trying to understand the big picture, standard bearing organizations and partner organizations. So trying to really get a sense of the whole ecosystem here. This was a pretty large qualitative investment. There are three people on this research team. And as I say, we did you know, about 44 semi-structured interviews. We didn't do a ton of sit down interviews that we did with some key informants, just a ton of observations and kind of in the moment interviews of ethnographic interviews when you're when you're watching people. We did archival data collection, et cetera. So this has been going on for a long time. So this, what? Was Epic what they were? Yes, yeah. Epic was their um, EHS system. But they also, this was, a, this was a, um, a system that was anticipating these changes that were coming on the pike. And they had actually invested in a data mart so they had hired, they had taken one of their top clinicians who was really invested in this and made him the chief like information officer. And he was behind, they had actually hired coders and everything. And they were, they were trying to be a cutting edge system in this change. And they created their own data mart where they were trying to kind of anticipate, get current data to come together and talk to each other and anticipate future needs. So they really thought of themselves as cutting edge. And they were, I mean, it's not that they just thought of themselves that way. Okay. So this is one of the things that we want to show, which is all of those properties that display, all those data that display the properties of good data or data with, data with high integrity, all of those properties can be undermined in a heartbeat. So we really, really want to challenge the idea that good data has stable inherent characteristics. So the question becomes, what are the conditions that usher in breakdowns of data integrity? And I'm going to go through each of these and give you some empirical examples, but changes in reporting needs. Like what, what are we, how, how are we supposed to spit out the data and in what format? Changes in technology. You have a new system. Do you have, you're trying to get two systems to talk to each other. Shifts in goals. What are we, what are we actually, what are we trying to shift the dial on based on political or external pressures? And changes in how reality is defined. So this is actually, this, this matters in healthcare. Well, we'll get into that. So I'm going to give you some, some kind of, uh, kind of ethnographic empirical examples of each of these to try and make them make sense and flesh them out. I won't go too far. So the first is changes in reporting needs and expectations. So in 2014, as I was saying, the Joint Commission implemented a core measure set, which every hospital needed to live in terms of, of quality measures that hospitals were required to report. I'm just going to talk about one, which is early elective delivery. So what happened in this situation is that the hospital system we studied was not collecting data in the format required by this. And so within, within the seconds of this, of this mandate coming down, their good data was not good anymore. So one of the examples of this is trying to distinguish between augmented delivery and induced delivery. So if a woman comes in to the hospital and she's in pre-labor and you give her a drug, Pitocin or oxytocin to induce, to, to, no, to augment the labor, that is technically a different process than if you have given the same drug to a woman who's not in, pre, not in early labor. 
Well, before this, they, no one really cared. You got the baby out, right? That was the point. But the Joint Commission really cared about whether or not you were augmenting or inducing. This, and actually, this is highly political differences because there's been more and more political pressure against inducing labor. But augmenting labor is like, well, you know, we're helping it along. So it became important to collect data about the onset of labor, which is just not a factor they were ever even tracking. There was no codes for it. There was no place in the, in the record system to, to, to track the onset of labor, et cetera. So the existing data was basically immediately functionally unusable. And although previously it had been adequate. So that's an example of a change in reporting needs that changed everything. And this is a long quote that I won't read you, but you can see here, this is the director of the nationwide initiative to standardize obstetrictional data-driven definitions talking about right now, if I ask a room full of physicians, if a woman shows up with intermittent contractions and you give her the drug, is that induction or augmentation? It's 50-50, they don't agree. So that can't be the case. Like that doesn't make sense from a data reporting. When she says it can't be the case, she means from a data reporting standpoint. So you can't stick that into the medical, medical record and then do a performance measure if there's 50-50 agreement on what is what. So a lot of this is trying to change the nomenclature. If they, right now they're calling everything augmentation because that's the way they were trained, but that's not what the Joint Commission wants. So the bottom line is you can't do quality improvement because the data doesn't show you actually when they're doing the thing that we don't want them to do, which is induce. So you can see the problems here. Okay, another one, the technology changes. Okay, go back. Yeah. yeah. So if the point here to illustrate by example, at least the four questions. Yes. The next step would be to do more prevalence. So I don't have, that's a great question. We don't have measures of how prevalent each of these happens. And we, I don't think our data gathering techniques would allow us to do that. We're not, you know, we're not trying to kind of do a survey of how often does this or that happen. What we're trying to show here is a proof of case that each of these do happen and can happen and that they can therefore fundamentally change the quality of data resources. And that's something we need to attend to when we're understanding the potential of data. <laughs> that's a great question. Okay, so I will say in a place like healthcare, reporting needs are changing all the time. The Joint Commission is very active and how they, what's, what they want you to measure, how they want you to measure it, and how they want you to report it is an ongoing conversation. It's very complicated. This one happens a lot. This one also happens a lot because every time you get a new system or you want two systems to talk to each other or you have just a basic upgrade in your old system, it can change the technological requirements for the data. So I will tell you which ones happen more often and which ones happen in my mind less often. This one's quite, quite common as well. And this is true across organizations who are buying, you know, investing in these big platforms. So the data center is in the process of linking two previously disconnected data sets in order to create the measures wanted by the Joint Commission. Administrative data, that's basically billing and insurance codes with birth certificate data. The idea being, look, we're collecting these data, they should just talk to each other. Well, they don't. And they don't based on the systems that each of these are kind of plugged into. So, when the data center began comparing these two, they very quickly realized that the birth certificate data across the state did not match the claims data. Well, why not? You've got two different occupations collecting data for two different purposes. So you've got insurance coders who are coding something for the you know, specific end goal of being reimbursed. And up until now, you have birth certificate record keepers who are just you know, filling out a birth certificate. No one noticed it. It was like you sent it home with the parents. It was proof of birth. It wasn't actually quality metrics that the hospital were held accountable to. It was just like, here, look, you had your baby on October 5th. Now go home. And, you know, they, they were not trained to be highly, highly specific in their coding practices, the birth certificate record keepers. So you know what they did? Giant statewide initiative to retrain birth certificate coders. Every birth certificate coder had to go to this retraining to figure out how to code in a way that was going to communicate with the billing codes because they're because the, because the two technologies didn't talk and the, and the practices behind them didn't talk. Okay, and things that they weren't do, being very precise about were things like gestational age, diabetes status, mother's health status, etc. Okay, another one, a new organizational goal. What's the whole point of being a data-driven organization if you can't turn the dial? 
if you can't use that data to change practice. That's the like, that's the dream, right? So this happens quite common as well. The idea that we can use these data to turn the dial. And one of the ones that was very political at the time of our study was C-section rates, as we talked about earlier. This was not from our, our, well, this was from our field site and that they gave it to us, but they did not develop it. This was a kind of an information, information visualization sheet that was being passed out and shared very broadly. So to the hospitals, to, you know, on websites, to, you know, pregnant women trying to figure out where to give birth. A tale of two births, right? So this is Sarah and Maya expecting their first child. Look at how different their situations can be. And then it's all, if you go to a high-performing hospital, that's what you're going to have. If you go to a low-performing hospital, that's what you're going to have, right? So this is this political pressure to change these section rates. It's very strong. They passed this around in meetings while we were there being like, look, the story's already out there. We have to like live in terms of this. We have to lower are what is seen as elective C-section rates in order to be competitive at a landscape of organization. So they spearheaded initiatives, which is a bold goal to reduce their overall low risk C-section rate for first time people giving birth. They're trying to you know, narrow it in to less than 12%. And this, is a, this was a quote from the meeting where they pass this around, which is the community is already policing us. We need to police ourselves. So the task force, which I was talking about earlier, collected the C-section rates for the hospitals. But that wasn't enough to really turn the dial and get clinicians to change their practices. There was enough like, oh, that person did it, that person did it. So they attempted, so they, and they, so they attempted to then go down to the individual clinician level to try and publicly shame and then change behavior of individual clinicians. And they found that it was just impossible. So the data was complete enough for an accurate calculation at the hospital rate, but it was anything but complete when it was tied to individual doctors. Basically, it was just off because you had the attending clinician being responsible for the decisions of all the residents under them. They found out that some clinicians didn't even have a number. So they were like not being tied to any behavior. I mean, it was just really messy when it came down to the clinician level. So here you see a new goal emerges and your current data at the hospital level, which is complete and accurate, is not so at the individual level. There's a scale question here. Uh, last but not least, I think this one's probably pretty unusual <laughs> if you want to know how often this happens, but we did see this happen, which is basically a change in the definition of regality. So while we were studying in 2013, professional standard bearing organizations aimed to standardize obstetrical definitions. This was this person talking, there's been this whole mandate to try and create definitions so that we can create data that live up to the definitions. If the definitions are vague, then the data is not stable. So one of the things they did was they changed the definition of what a full term baby was. So prior to this 38 weeks was considered full term. Through political pressure and this national wide standard bearing organizations discussion, they changed it to 40 weeks as being full term. They actually changed the reality of what a full term baby is. And that matters for all of the data that was collected around whether or not it was a, you know, a delivery that happened once it was early term, full term, late term, or post term. So this was a this was a nice helpful sheet they gave to all the hospitals about look we've changed the definition now live in terms of it. So you can see here that there's this kind of they had already had initiatives in place to address the delivery of babies prior to full term, but then you've shifted that out by two weeks, and so it's really changed whether or not it exceeded accurate data. So our main insight here is that the properties of data integrity emerge in practice and they're always flexioning and they're always relational. So what is good data is never a steady state. There is no garbage in, garbage out. There is garbage in for this particular moment, in this particular system and this particular ecology. And what is seen as not garbage can turn into garbage if any of these external factors change. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There is a movement in healthcare now So I'm going to repeat you so that they can hear. There's a movement in healthcare to, to do predictive analytics on individual situations. Yeah. Yes, that's exactly it. Okay. Sort of probability or, or the fact 
and then yeah so this is the future of health initiative so we can we can do probabilities to understand who's going to keel over when and then we can do interventions well that's taking so the future of health stuff which i'm su i find super problematic personally we have some very strong proponents of the future of health initiatives in my university and i talked to them and they're like oh i hadn't thought about that i mean it's it's so there's two things one how do you measure success when your success is, is something not happening Right, so any sort of predictive analytics are very difficult to measure because the success is a, a preventing something and that's almost impossible to actually quantify. So you can quantify it against you know big numbers, but like if you were gonna get a heart attack and you didn't, that's success. But how do we know you were gonna get it? Yeah, you know, so that's one issue with predictive analytics. The second issue with predictive analytics is kind of what we choose to anticipate causes new forms of data accountability for clinicians. So like, let's say, so I actually have a, a colleague, Yunnan Chen, looking at predictive analytics in CT scans. And the problem is the clinicians get so much data that they no longer have the capacity to actually predict. Like they can't actually do, they don't have enough capacity to actually do the predictive analytics on the ground. And they're hot, hot held to a higher standard of, predict, of, of prevention. So if something were to happen and they were given the CT scan and they didn't act on it, then they're like twice as liable. So that's another problem. In terms of this here, I think that anytime what we wanna do is we wanna create a degree of humbleness into the data that we're collecting. So if predictive analytics are saying that these are the measures, we wanna know where those measures are coming from and how they're being maintained. Hi, Siraj. Hi, Melissa. Very, very interesting, fascinating fact. Um, I, I had a question. Do, do you have a sense for how how much of any given data set or, 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 or on average is affected by these different issues? Is this more at the edges? You know, the, the last week of full term right. data is, is, con is contaminated, but everything else is good. So, so what's the what's some sense of magnitude here? Yeah, so I think it's tricky to both analyze the boundary conditions like you're talking about is kind of when, you know, at what, at what point does it matter? I think um, this is unique to healthcare potentially, but those boundary conditions are actually where a lot of hospital policies are built around. So the idea being that the normal patient is not what we're building our, our, our policies around. We're trying to, so, so if, if we're really worried about our quality measures, then we need those boundary condition people to be successful in the system. So a lot of the interventions here are around high risk agencies, around you know the people that are coming in almost full term, whether or not we're inducing too early. Like it's all of these borderline cases that evidence-based medicine really actually comes into play. If you're a very kind of lockstep patient, you'd almost you know that's not that's not where the hospital's worried. They're not worried about you. So unfortunately, I think you're right that these are happening more at the boundaries, but that that's where the hospital policy is really focusing. And I don't know how, I think it's a really great question for a different study, but to think about how would you actually measure how much of the data is corrupted based on these different issues, right? So if you change the reality, all the data is corrupted, right? If you change kind of the kind of, you know, induction versus augmentation kind of, you know, reporting, it's only people who come in at that, with that like particular issue. So I think there's a lot of variability there and it'd be worth investigating. Hi, Rory. Hi. Thanks. This is a, a great study. I just I wanted to ask you signaled this at the beginning, but I think I caught it in this slide when you say that data properties are always relational, never inherent. I mean, it's a pretty provocative statement. And I and I just wonder if if we can ever argue that there are some inherent characteristics of, of good data so that not everything is constructed here. Um, so I would they answer you by saying yes it's provocative on purpose i you picked that up but what i would say is i actually um i believe that if you had a steady state ecology meaning you don't have a lot of these changes that we're saying happen then you can have a steady state of, of quality data so the more the ecology is changing around the data the more relational it is because i believe it's inherently relational to that ecology so if you're changing the technology, 
if a if you're in a if you're in a industry you know like an institution like healthcare where the Joint Commission is remessing with your definitions all the time, it is inherently relational, and therefore it's going to be more problematic in an institution where that kind of external forces are changing things all the time. If you're an organization that's relatively stable in terms of those outside forces, I think your data could be relatively stable as good vis-a-vis -vis that ecology. Got it. So that, yeah, back to the healthcare thing, this, this is one where there is maybe even less than in some other settings uh, of a possibility of steady state. And so, you know, maybe, yeah. maybe you're, this, this provocative statement is actually, you know, go, goes with healthcare and maybe not some other things. So just to clarify, I don't, I don't think the provocative statement personally is that data is the quality of data integrity is always relational to the ecosystem. I think that's just a fact personally. What is provocative is that that ecosystem is always changing. So therefore we can never rely on good data. Got it. And Thank that you. I think depends on the institutional context. And yes, healthcare would be an extreme case in that. So I would be curious if those of you who've studied other kind of institutional spaces, if this, if this holds up. Yeah, so I, I, I was actually thinking about that because I, I study online software. So okay. I still can't do Like yeah. they were born with a technology stack with a set of processes to yeah. collect and analyze data. And they are changing a lot, right? Like their, yeah. their, 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 their process. Yeah dynamically changes more than in more stable institutions. Like they were charging fixed prices before, yeah. now then they went to dynamic prices, then they went to prices that are different yeah. between the seller and the buyer. So they're changing a lot, but they put in place things um, to avoid some of the mistakes that you are, you are highlighting. And I'd be adding, for example, data on when Change. So that you can anchor it to a time, place in time. So Kiara is talking about the fact that in online platforms, they can't hear you. So I'm just repeating that there that, be, that although the steady steady state is never stable, that it's always changing. These kind of tech focused people have put in practices of, with their data collection that allow you to kind of manage that change while maintaining some some kind of quality of the data integrity. Is that what you're suggesting? Yeah. yeah. Like, even if I know that the pricing of Uber two years ago was different, yeah. I, I know that. Right. I know that and I can adapt my analysis. So you can adapt your analysis based on the changing because the data is collected in such a way that allows that. So this is exactly the kinds of insights that we want this study to suggest, which is, and we'll get there in our last bit of what is the process of data crafting and what you're talking about, which is making me think is not, we're talking about retrospective crafting. You're talking about anticipatory. I like that idea a lot. Hi, Hannah. Hi, hi. So, 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 uh, uh, one comment and one uh, uh, one kind of question. Uh, uh, one comment is that uh, it, it may be kind of inherently difficult uh, to get good data uh, in a changing environment because the purpose of collecting data may be to learn something, and it may be kind of baked in that as we are learning, we are going to change the ecosystem, yeah. and therefore. If this is why we are why we are collecting data, it may be almost impossible yeah. to have a steady state, and we're always playing catch up. And yeah. the second uh, is is kind of a, a question that relates to what what Carol was saying, and maybe it's going to get into this boundary conditions. Uh, is it possible to have an ecosystem demands that demand more data that can be feasibly collected? And it may be different for different environments. So if we think about a data collected uh, by staff in a hospital where someone needs to enter this data, there are just natural limits. And it may be a steady state, but if we demand too much data, then we can just not, we will need to get more people running around the hospital just to collect the data that we need. Yeah. Whereas if we are talking about digital uh, uh, digital environments like platforms, what you know, Kara and, and I were, were working around, those data can be collected. We can basically collect all the data that exists just in case, and then yeah. later we can we can figure out how to tailor it. Uh, so 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 there may be some impossibility uh, uh, statements depending on the environment yeah. in, in the way the data is collected. So the kind of the capacities of collecting data change if it's somebody doing it, you know, like measuring a little test tube versus a sensor that's going to collect it more automatically behind the scenes. So I think that's really important kind of conditions on this. 
One of the things that I want to get into here really quickly, or I end with, is changing occupations based on this. And in healthcare, you actually see fundamental changes to the kinds of people who work in healthcare, new like job codes, one of them being a scribe, right? So they've this whole idea that we're collecting so much data that we need a whole new occupation of people who follow doctors around and take notes. Um, so there, I, and some of these are kind of changing pressures on existing occupations, like the birth certificate keepers who had a really chill job where they just filled out some forms and sent it home with the parents to a very high pressure job with a lot of microscope focused attention on what they're doing. No change in pay, obviously, but a lot of change in pressure. So we have changing pressures on certain occupations and the emergence of new occupations to manage these data collection needs. But I think what you're talking about is really interesting in terms of unpacking how hard it is to get these data and whether or not that allows for kind of a bigger bigger data set of collection and maybe collecting it in different formats or anticipating in different ways. I think that's really important. Becky. Yes. So instead of, so what it seems like they're asking about it is really data. I mean, taking something that exists in one, just like your example of kind of labor. Yeah. Or your earliest example was about onset, right? Yeah, it's for more nuanced definitions. Yeah. So some of, yeah, some of these, so people online, Becky's saying that some of these asks that I'm talking about, some of these conditions ask different things of the data. And some of them are asking for more nuanced delineations. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, so whether it's something, another- That's, that's helpful. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
that's what they're asking, giving the currently changing con condition. Do they go back to the core property, you know, core properties of data with high integrity? Are they displaying that? And do they, oh, look, I, I copied that, that's wrong. <laughs> so this work is done by hospital educators, which is another new occupation, managers, and again, clinical document improvement specialists. Clinical document improvement specialists is a whole occupation based on kind of being hands-on on this system. They're, they're usually RNs or people with expertise and relationships with doctors. They are actually reviewing the doctor's notes in real time, especially with high profile cases, meaning cases that are gonna cost a lot of money. And they actually will then literally in the middle of like, while a patient is still in the hospital, go find a clinician and say, what did you mean by this? They're actually making the record that the clinician takes legible to the people downstream, the insurance coders. And it requires a real artfulness because they need to have a good enough relationship with the doctors to be able to interrupt them, so forth. And they need to have enough professional expertise to know what they're looking for. It's a pretty high paying job, by the way. I'm wondering whether there's another step between improving the data, which comes from like taking the shock of the data. Oh. So Oh, I think you're right. I need to write this stuff down. Okay, I won't forget this. That's you're right. Because there's sometimes when it's put in use, then you realize it's a problem. Yeah, that's a great. So, yeah. I'll take it. Oh, um, thanks, Melissa. I've been listening in and all of this is super insightful. And I think the, the process diagram is also really interesting. And a couple of questions about how much of this is like specific to healthcare. And in particular, I'm thinking about one thing I don't see here is typically what you see in like a more traditional business context is the structured data that are used to shape decision-making. And that's what a bunch of literature is about. Um, while here, it seems like data quality is important in and of itself uh, for reporting reasons or for yeah. uh, or for um, policy reasons almost. Yeah. And so I wonder if in a more generalizable version of this figure, you might also have decision makers, yeah. not just purely the mo monitoring could maybe even be reconceptualized as maybe the CEO comes back or salespeople come back and tell me, hey, I would like to see this measure. Could you go and fix how you collect it? No, I think that's excellent. And one of the things I didn't talk about just because you have to hone in is that they then get help, they get graded and get these kind of the big statewide centers will give them measures, like they'll grade the different hospitals and they really matter for decision-making and practice within the hospital. So there is an element of that. I think it's separated out. It's more abstract because it goes to a, you know, a quality center at the statewide level rather than just a CEO intervening. Decision-making and use. Thank you. I'm gonna remember these two. Yes. Oh yeah, it's giant part. The giant everything to do with healthcare has to do with risk management. There is no getting away from it. No, you're right. I gotta write this stuff down. Okay, risk management, decision making. Will you write that down for me? Risk management decision-making and use of the data. I think these all have to be integrated better. Thank you. Okay, and we're gonna go, just let me get through this really quickly. So basically, these are the people who investigate and they're always asking, is this a data issue or a practice issue? Is the data wrong or are we wrong? It's very hard to untangle sometimes. That's the job of these people in the monitoring role. They're asking this question all the time. I'm not going to get into this too much, but basically this is buddy state. This is just a, a data manager in the hospital system talking about how complicated that is to figure out, is it us? Is it them? What's going on? Actually also holding our metrics around with our competitor set. So we have a 39% exclusive breast milk feeding. That looks really bad until you look at our competitors and realize that, oh my gosh, it's actually pretty good. So it's also anchoring what is good or bad based on your competitor set. So all of this is what the monitoring is. They might they might think that this is something they you investigate, and then they realize actually compared to our competitors, this is great, so we're not going to investigate it. So they're doing a lot of, you know, there are a lot of kind of the monitoring is multifaceted. And then sometimes it moves to improving, which would be either changing organizational processes, redesigning information systems, retraining front run workers. So this is your birth certificate clerk example. This is a new code. They had to put a new code in the electronic health record to say, 
Was it induced or augmented? We weren't capturing that. That actually required a new field. So that's changing the information system, changing the organization practice, who talks to who, et cetera. We see all of these happening here. And then my, oh, that's improving. This is about different, different, very detailed issue about whether or not they're capturing the right data about steroid shots. This was the idea that you, when a woman comes in, you get two steroid shots, 12 hours apart. What happens if she gives birth between the 12 hours? Well, they didn't, they used to just not log it. Well, that looked like they weren't actually completing the cycle of care. So they were being dinged to not complete the cycle of care because they weren't actually getting an insane baby born, therefore a second shot not delivered. So the last thing we wanna say is that basically there's still a lot of subjectivities here. We don't think they're gonna go away. It requires situating judgment, decision-making, new forms of expertise and so forth. And they're masked once the data elements have been created. Um, okay, and these are my last thoughts and then I'll take the questions. My last thoughts, data crafting, it's ongoing work. And we need to think about the potential costs and benefits when we think about actual investments. Two, literature touts the benefits, but underestimates the financial, temporal and personnel resources. Three, garbage in, garbage out, depends on the ecosystem. Parting thoughts, the data crafting organizations. This is where I wanna think about, this is future work, but I wanna think about what this means for occupations. So I do see that there are changing occupations and emerging occupations and changes in power dynamics and changes in kind of, you see this, I've seen this in other papers coming out about new occupations. And I think this has a lot to do with it. And we need to merge the story of emerging occupations with the story of data because these two are highly related. And that's my last slide. So now I'll answer whatever questions you have. Okay. Um, okay, uh, so I was just wondering, um, thanks so much. I was just wondering um, if you could say a bit about who's setting the standards. So, um, you know, like are these data quality standards at the hospital department level, hospital level, national, like state? Um, yeah, I, like, and I, I do you have some good examples of new standards that are particularly kind of designed for big data analysis? So there's a joint commission that is the ones that are pulling in data from different hospitals. A joint commission is, is housed by all kinds of different people at the local level and the state level. And they are the federal bodies that are bringing in the new standards. And there are, we do have more data on, we didn't study the joint commission, but we studied the state level commission that feeds into the joint commission. So we do have level uh, some data on how that happens. That's just not this story. Michael? Hey, Melissa, um, great, great session. Uh, I want to sort of take you to a, perhaps a different level of analysis in the seminar. And I mean, I love the notion of, of data crafting, but when I hear the word data crafting, I, I, I immediately move to data cooking. Uh, you know? Fair enough. And uh, professionals cooking data um, and sort of the politics of decision making. Someone a few minutes ago, yep. I'm having, having trouble hearing the room, but when you link data to decision making, yeah. particularly when ecosystems are changing. So, you know, you know, Hila's work at NASA, she yep. was at the seminar recently. I know, there's a lot of uh, intersection between Hila's work and mine. It was interesting that you had us back to back. Yeah, totally. Um, but when ecosystems are changing, the nature of the data is changing and that sort of brings you into the world of power and politics and data crafting yeah. becomes cooking. Yeah. So, so could, could you talk to that? Um, I mean, most of the I'm, I'm, data crafting and service or decision making sounds kind of nice, but I kind of know <laughs> in the dynamics of technical change and ecosystem yeah. change, ugly things happen. So can you, can you speak to that? When you say you believe things happen, you saying that you believe that there isn't a cooking element or that there is? Oh, I think there's a big deal cooking element to it. Okay. That, that uh, takes it into the world of like raw power and politics yes. when professional identities are threatened. I 120% agree with you. But I, what I do hope is that if we can bring this analysis into the light of day, and make normalize that all data have to be crafted. They don't exist, you know, as these kind of harvestable resources. 
and that we can quote unquote craft with care, <laughs> or if you want to say cook with care, right. that that's kind of the, the best we can hope for, for an ethical standpoint for these dynamics. I think the more that they are hidden and the more that we have a rationalized view of data and its potential, the more the danger for that cooking to happen in ways that aren't seen behind the scenes. Um, so almost in a way, normalizing the cooking as part of the process allows us to have a more ethical process, I believe. I'm not, I mean, that's a super optimistic answer. Um, but I don't, I just don't think the data exists without cooking or crafting. It just doesn't work that way. Yeah. And so we have to own it. Yeah, no, I think that's a super response, Melissa. And I, and I think that where I would be looking are, are at junctures when the ecosystems are changing. Yes. And sort of capture the pre ecosystem changing and the post and the transparency of the crafting slash cooking. Yeah. And the extent to which people actually have a dialogue about, hey, wait a minute, my data looks really different than your data. Well, and that's and where I actually crafting looks different than your crafting, and yeah. we acknowledge that. That may yeah, be well, a way through this dilemma. Well, I wonder because healthcare is really interesting here because, like, these people who are tasked with monitoring the data, these people over here, all of these monitoring, investigating, and improving people, that's their job. Right, so this is not like they're doing it behind the scenes to make the data look pretty and to pretend like the data, you know, is a super polished thing. So because that's their job, we had that's just the idea of clinical documentation specialists, data educators. They have a new another new occupation hospital that are literally just health educators who are out there supposed to read the newest research and see if it's being put into practice and then educate people. There's some identity issues between educators who are focused on patient care and hospital administration that is focused on profits. So there's some clashing there. But either way, I think that there are more and more roles. And if those roles are made explicitly with the understanding that these people are here to kind of monitor, manage, craft, and cook the data, however you want to say it, that those conversations are more likely to happen. And you know, some of this is clarification too, going back to a clinician saying, what did you mean when you said this, rather than making a guess behind the scenes, and of course there's gonna be some gaming, but again, I think that the, 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 as you say, the more we have these open conversations and then we have occupations that are, this is your job to do this, the better off we're gonna be as a whole society that's gonna rely more and more on data to make all kinds of decisions. Super great. That's my, that's my like mission. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yay. Here's for the hybrid sessions. Thank you all for, for asking such great questions and participating, even though you're sitting all over the place. It's, um, it's, it's oh, we have more questions. Well, I, you feel free to, to contact me. As I said, this, because we're literally about to kind of revise this paper, it's a really lovely time for me to be thinking about the stakes, for me to be thinking about what's missing in this model. So I really appreciate the input. This is not this is not done cooking, <laughs> so thank you.